Welcome to Fueling Your Legacy, hosted by Samuel Knickerbocker. Each week, we expose the faulty foundational mindsets of the past and rebuild a new, stronger foundation essential in creating your legacy. We've got a lot of work to do, so let's get started. Welcome to Fuel Your Legacy podcast. We're super excited. Uh, I don't get a ton of guests that are super successful, number one, but more importantly, that are reaching out, right? There's, there's a lot of people who are successful that I reach out with, and they, they come on my podcast, but it's truly an honor to have um, you on today. To Nicholas has had, had his team reach out to me to be on my podcast. He saw value there, and so that, that's an honor for me. I'm grateful for that. Um, he's the author and host of The Billion Dollar Body. He has his podcast. He's got his website, the Billion Dollar, bleh, the Billion Dollar Body.com. So go check that out. There's going to be links in the show notes here. Um, but I'm going to turn the time over to him because he's got a crazy awesome story and he can tell it better than I can. So I uh, will let you have the floor, Nicholas. Hey, Sam. Well, I appreciate you first off putting the show together. And for us, like we truly saw the name and the name in itself was like something that we knew we resonated with because for me, just for people to know is like, now it's cool being featured in Forbes for doing seven figures and like going from carpet cleaner to, you know, million dollars in sales and all these little things. Yet the biggest thing for me is that the reason why we went into business in the first place was that my wife and I went to like 16 different countries together serving the poor. So I remember I went on one stint to Bulgaria, Turkey, Greece, France, Scotland, London, South Africa, Mozambique, Africa, and then to Mexico City. And all that time I was out there just serving poor, living in garbage dumps, not taking showers for a week. And I was with a group of about 1,200 people total, but we were in small little pods. And I realized that almost every person couldn't afford to actually go overseas and go serve the poor. I thought that was the dumbest thing I ever heard. I was like, you mean there's, there's people that work really hard in America in an AC office and then there's people that actually want to go serve the poor, but the people in the AC office can't go serve the poor, but they have money. And the people that want to serve the poor don't have any money to go serve them. I was like, what if we bridge this gap? And so I remember, again, my wife and I were two people out of the 1,200. And I thought, what if I started a business? And what if I could actually fund people to go serve the poor? And those 1,198 people could go rather than just us two. And I've always thought that way throughout my business. And life is like, well, rather than just being the person who does it, what if I could teach other people to do it and multiply the impact that we're looking to create? So impact and, and living, leaving a legacy has always been something that's been big for me and always like trying to figure out and navigate how do you do that, right? For the people that are listening, like how do you figure out exactly how to do that? I'll show you, share with you guys a few things that I learned along the way. And my life, again, started out as someone completely normal. I grew up in a middle-class home. My dad and my mom fought all the time. I remember at four years old, they actually split up. And at four years old, I also got my first motorcycle. So think like, I want to be a professional motocross racer. That's what my dad wanted me to do. And then also my parents just split up. So at seven years old, I actually wrote my first suicide letter. I remember just feeling like the pressure inside the home, right? If my mom didn't like my dad. So when I was with my mom, I had to act like I didn't like him as well. And when I was with my dad, my dad didn't like my mom. And so I had to act like I didn't like my mom. I remember even getting told that like child support was actually my mom making my dad pay to see me. I was like, wow, my mom's such a jerk. Like, what is she thinking? And this caused such mass anxiety in me that by the uh, third grade, I actually physically couldn't go to school because I had so many stomach issues from mass anxiety. So that the person I was and the life that I was living was not catering to causing great success. Though my dad was my biggest mentor. And again, like my dad was a business owner and he taught me something that we can all take away, which is you can always exchange value for dollars. Meaning that he said if he had a lawnmower and a weed whacker, he would never go broke. He's like, I could lose my business. I could lose everything. But there's always going to be grass. There's always going to be hedges. And if I exchange value for dollars, I could always create money on demand. So I knew that from a young age, but I didn't have this thought of like legacy and something that people would remember. I just had, I guess I'll make enough money so I can go buy ice cream and I can go out there and like buy a motorcycle if I wanted to. But I had nothing big that was going on in my life. And I truly believe that your life can change in one moment for the positive or negative. And the first experience I had was for the negative two times. I remember being 13 years old and I just wanted the approval of my dad so bad. And I believe a lot of men out there want this as well. I've coached over 600 men one-on-one -on -one, and I realized that like a lot of it goes back to like they wish they had their father's approval or the father that they never had, they wish that they could gain his approval. I remember feeling the same thing. I thought, 
man, my dad wants me to be a professional motocross racer. And if I'm the best in the world, then he'll love me. So I went up to him and I said, dad, listen, I'm going to be the best in the world. I'm going to, we can quit school. We're going to get a tutor. We're going to travel. And he looked at me and he said, Nicholas, you'll never be the best. And that was like the straw that broke the camel's back. I just remember sitting there like everything I'd ever wanted in life was taken away from me at 13 years old. From the rest of my high school years, I gained 60 pounds. I graduated with a 1.8 GPA and I had no girlfriend all throughout my high school years. And it was all because of just one moment, like that one moment that changed my life. And then equally, I remember being 18 years old and this random kid at school, I'm 60 pounds overweight, wearing the same sweatshirt every single day. So scared to go outside because I might get invited to a pool. If I got invited to a pool, I was overweight. And if I was overweight, I had to wear a shirt. And if I wore a shirt, people were like, why are you wearing a shirt in the pool? So it was just like all these insecurities, right, that we all go through. And I remember this guy pulling out a bag of fruit. And I said, dude, why are you eating fruit? Like, I didn't know anyone else who ate healthy. And he said, I have a boxing trainer that wants me to perform at my highest level and also wants me to weigh in at the correct weight. And I just had this epiphany that like health wasn't just about looking good because I didn't have a purpose to look good, but it was also about performance. And I knew that I always want to do something big with my life. So I left there, never talked to him again, just bought the same meal that he had. And I ate it over and over again for six months and lost 60 pounds, like the worst way possible. I was too scared to go to the gym and everything. But I started finding my purpose in first investing in myself and loving myself again and taking actions. So I lost the 60 pounds. I reconnected with my father. I met my girlfriend that's now my wife of seven years. And we got married at 20 and 18. And this was right around the time when I was out there serving the poor. And I was like, okay, there's people that can't afford to serve the poor. And I need to provide for my family. What do I do? And that's when we both went into business together. And I would love to say that all of a sudden it was like we skyrocketed. We joined network marketing for one year. It's our first year in business. Thought that I had retired. I literally was telling people, oh, yeah, what do you guys do? I'm like, oh, I'm retired. I just live off residual income, right? Like that's like what you were told to do. I lost everything in that year. We got driven into debt. I had to go and clean carpets for two and a half years before like my life changed again in just one moment. And I remember my wife going to a live event. And for anyone out there that hasn't been to a live event, I was blessed that people told me that if you want to be successful, you go to live events. And my wife went to one without me. They actually pitched a $5,000 live event. I'm like, we're already at a live event. You're at a live event. Now they're pitching a $5,000 live event. She called me and she's like, Nicholas, you wouldn't believe it. There's this thing and I want to buy it. And I'm like, I didn't have any of the emotions, right? Like I didn't feel all the same things she felt, but I knew she would never do anything that would hurt us. So I let her invest in it. She came home and I just felt something different. And six months later, nothing had changed, but that one event was coming out. And all my friends were telling me, Nicholas, you should refund. Like you haven't got anything from the program. Like imagine if you could pay off some of that debt. And I was so tempted, but it's so interesting that Tony Robbins, he says, in the moments of decision, your destiny is shaped. I knew that that was just the wrong thing to do. I went to that one event. My life was changed forever. That was in the beginning of 2016. We booked out $20,000 in sales that month. And I have never had a not profitable month since then. And so the power of live events, the power of the people you surround yourself with, and the power of the information that you have transformed my family's life and my life forever. Yeah, that's awesome. So then what that you went from carpet cleaner to what, what is your business now? I know you kind of alluded to it as far as funding people to go serve the poor, but what, what exactly is your business now? Yeah, so we work with the, the leading businessmen of tomorrow, so men that own businesses only, and we help them become three-dimensional, meaning prospering in health, wealth, and relationships, the three core areas that no man can outsource. No one can eat for you. No one's going to sit there and sleep with your wife for you. And on top of that, nobody's going to go out there and actually build the business and vision for you either. So if we can't outsource it, we should probably get good at it. And we actually equip them through live events. We equip them through educational platforms and through the community of brotherhood, changing the people they surround themselves with. And the way that we know we're successful is if we create a three-dimensional businessman that's also inspiring other men to do the same thing. And our goal is to actually influence and consult nations around the world through the model that we're creating throughout our men. That's awesome. So you work specifically with men, no women, no women. Well, just out of curiosity, do you see that in the future? If your wife started to do something just for women on, on their side or no, we could yet. I do see so much value. There's so many women's events out there. 
Like I'm in Southern California. There's a women's event every single week. Yet yeah, men's events, men are too scared to go to them. They're like, oh, like I don't feel comfortable. Like it's just not something that's done anymore. Why? Because society wants men and women to be the exact same, but we're just very different. So for me, I found that with coaching the men, one, I was the one coaching. And I didn't want to talk to someone else's wife about how much they hated their husband. I thought that was kind of awkward. And so what I ended up doing was working with the men because I understood what it felt like to be a man. I could speak from a man's perspective. And on top of that, I truly believe that inside of a household, a man is the leader of the home, meaning, check this out, uh, when back in the day, there was kings and queens. A king took the burden for the castle and the burden for everything that he owned. The queen had the same amount of authority as the king but with none of the burden. So for me, helping these man, men raise up and rise up in the home, raise, rise up in their relationships actually is allowing the queen to have more authority and the man's taking responsibility for his life rather than women feeling like they have to take all the pressure in the household. Because you look at like the last 100 years, the male testosterone high of today is the low of 100 years ago. And now men aren't working on farms with their kids. Men are going to, well, first it was going to factories. Now it's going to a job, which means that men, kids like me, when I was a kid, we get raised by our moms, which is awesome. And then we go to school and eight out of nine teachers are women until we get into high school. And we learn how to be a man from a women's perspective that are not men. And we end up doing what they would want, but would never marry. This is why women are so, so interested in the bad boys, right? Like it's always like, why do you always fall for the, for the bad guys? Like the guys that wear leather jackets and ride motorcycles because like naturally they're attracted to the good qualities of that. They're friends with the girls, right? But they wouldn't marry women. Most women wouldn't, right? But, but then men are acting like women and never can get a woman to stay with them because they fall into the friend zone. So a long story short, yeah, sure. I would do something in the future. Yet right now I see the need in the world, being the man rising up, being a leader inside the household to empower his entire family. Sure. That's, that's awesome. I'm, I'm going to bring out a few points and kind of work backwards, but I love your perspective and the way you explain um, how to actually empower women, like take, take the responsibility off of them so that they actually can go do what they like, what they feel like they need to do or whatever. But they're, they're getting that power from not having to take that responsibility on not having to take on that weight. So I, I love that. Yeah. Like um, men, like people will say men are the provider of their home. And believe me, for me, old masculinity is also stupid. Like being a jerk, being closed off, you know, being the disciplinary only, but not being open that that's dumb as well. But equally a man just being like a woman and, and being flamboyant or whatever is it's fine. I don't really care, but I look at fruit. Like I look at the results of what people are doing. So obviously the results of the old days didn't bring connection in the home. Like kids didn't like their dad. Now it's not giving a good result either. So it's like, how do we find the middle ground of being open, being vulnerable, being powerful, but also like, let's say provider of the home. Provider of the home doesn't mean that the woman can't make more money. It's just that the burden falls on the man so that the woman can go do what she loves to do and not have to worry about providing for the house. Does that make sense? Sure. Like, uh-huh. Yeah, absolutely. So be creative. It's, it's interesting because in my, in my industry that I work in, um, I am able, I actually have an agency that I, that I train other agents to, to do what I do, but it, it's very, I'm very adamant that my income and what I provide for my family, how I support my family isn't done on the backs of those people. Now, if they are working and I get more money, that's great, but it's not done on the backs of, of my team. I'm providing for my family all by myself regardless of what anybody else does. And that, that enables me to then be a better coach and a better mentor because I have no vested, no real vested uh, survival interest in them, them doing X, Y, or Z. And I think that's the same thing with the women. Uh, a lot of women, I think they're probably in a lot of cases more capable of out earning men if they just went and did what they love to do, but they're so stressed out about um, the, the other stuff and pr- taking care of the home front that they are not actually able to go. And we, and we get and to hear it all over here, right? Like all the wives, all the girlfriends of all the guys in the community. I have women reach out to us every day that are like, please, can you please change this man? Like he has greatness inside of him. Like, think about it. You had a one in 400 trillion chance of being born. The only way you were born was because you had greatness, right? You had to beat one in 400 trillion odds. So I already believe that every single person alive is a winner. 
We just need to extract the winner. It's not like putting it inside of them. It's taking it out of them. And so when a lot of the women are like, can you please like get them in the environment? Please. Like, can you get them into an event? Please. Can you educate them? Cause I know they're great, but they're playing small just as I was. Like my, my transition seems really quick from carpet cleaner to being featured in Forbes and all these things. But truly I was carpet cleaner that was going to networking events that was going to business events. And a lot of times I wouldn't show up. I would look at the thing and I'd be like, man, there's you have to pay for parking there. Like, I don't think I can do it. Right. And that, like, I, I still remember this day dropping my wife off at an event that was free. I had a free ticket as well, but the parking was 30 bucks. So instead I went and hit a bucket of golf balls bought golf balls for 15 bucks to save 15 bucks. Yet I was completely broke. And that decision that I was making was literally just keeping me broke, trying to save money rather than trying to invest in things that were going to give me more because not paying for parking actually costs me a lot more money than paying for parking. Yeah, absolutely. Especially in that case. And that's the other thing when it's so tempting for people who, who are struggling with the financial mindset to really handle debt um, because our society's, uh, I think they've conflated debt. They, they've said all debt is the same rather than investment debt and, or, or I would just say an investment rather than investment debt, investment and consumer debt. Consumer debt is wildly different than an investment. And so it's, it's a certain mindset and frequency that would say, oh, get your money back so you can pay off the debt. It's like the whole reason I went into debt was to get the, the event. So like, I would just be, I would, I would literally be nowhere if I did that. So I'm, I'm glad yeah, that you like recognize for, for this that. type of mindset. We go into as much debt as fast as we can because of the opportunities there for an ROI, we'll do whatever it takes to get in. I believe that's the difference that where I went from a mindset of scarcity where they kept me broke to an entrepreneur truly was that thought of, it doesn't matter what it costs. It matter what it, what it, what the return is. Right. Yeah. It's like if there was a home here in California that was one million dollars with two hundred thousand dollar rehab and then it sold for one point eight, I would buy the house. Why? Absolutely. I would find the money because of the deal and the ROI, not because of the cost. I'm not looking for a low priced home. I'm looking for a home that has a high ROI. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. I was thinking about this just yesterday actually. I went to a, a meeting that I sat in for about five hours and I was like, man, I could be doing all these appointments. I could be meeting with clients. I could be doing so many other things for my five hours. Um, and I'm listening to this speaker and I got like two or three things out of it, two or three nuggets that I really believe are going to change how people perceive me and how people see me online. Um, it's like, was it worth those two or three things? Absolutely. I would, I would pay it again or double or triple that just to get those two or three things. And once you get into that higher class mindset, that's really what we think what people are thinking. Like I'll spend a hundred grand. If you can give me two or three things that are going to help me level up my game, then let, let give it to me. Right. And don't make it take six months. The lower class mindset is saying, okay, well, how long do I get this? Do I get you for six months? Well, then I should, I should only pay $500 an hour. If I only get one hour a month, then I should only pay whatever. And it's like that, that type of mindset, they're still looking, they're still trading money for time. And they're, and they're thinking linear, linearly as money is time and time is money rather than value. And they're just two completely opposite ends of the spectrum. So I love that. All right. And it's then, like how it's the, how much stuff do I get with this mentality rather than like, what is this going to do? Right. It's like, would you rather have 10 homes that are underwater or would you rather have one home that has profit? It's like, would you rather me give you one video that makes you rich or do you want a hundred videos that you can go through that will make you poor? Like, mm-hmm. Right. But people will take a hundred videos with this. And luckily they're listening to your show. This is one of the biggest things that I've seen is like, if you want something, find someone who's doing it or has done it just recently, not someone who did it a long time ago and invest to learn what they did. Because if they're cheap to invest in, then they probably haven't done a lot. There's a lot of people out there that are cheap, right? You can invest for their time. If their time is cheap, then they probably haven't done that many great things. So ultimately invest, but actually apply. Obviously, that's the big thing. My first event I went to, I, I'm a firm believer in live events for two reasons. People always say it's not what you know, but who you know. But I think it's uh, both combined. My mentor once told me that. And the only place that you can truly get who you know with what you know combined is inside of a live setting at a live event. So you're killing two birds with one stone for way less of an investment because the host has to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars and you're investing like 300 or a thousand bucks or whatever into a ticket. And you get all this like cool prizes or whatever. And so you get to learn from the best people. So when I first went to business, someone said, Nicholas, you have to go to live events. 
I was like, nah, dude, I have to go be successful and then I'll invest in myself. And he's like, Nicholas, this doesn't make any sense. You don't get to have success and then invest in your education. You invest in your education and then you have success. So he made me go out to that event. And at that event, everyone else was like, oh, I've already heard this before. They took some notes, but they weren't taking action. I didn't know about this. So I actually listened to the speaker. I remember his name, Jason O'Toole. And he said, if you just do these things, you'll do $12,500 in sales. Well, this was my very first month in business. So I was like, let's do it. Like, I'm going to do exactly what he said for 30 days. And if it doesn't work, it's his fault. So I remember like I wrote down everything. I did $12,546 in sales in 30 days. Like the exact number, just $46 over. And I was like, oh my gosh, like this stuff works. And I think being that, having that childlike beginner faith again, and just like, not listening to a podcast. I mean like, yeah, like I just want to see like what, what I get from it. No, I just invested just now. I have a $50,000 group I'm a part of. And in this group, we just had a meeting and I have 22 pages of notes. The dumbest thing I could do is be like, those notes are good. Now I got to get back to work. No, write down your action items on the other side of those notes to take action so that you can get an ROI. Yeah. There's no, there's no point in even writing it down if you're not going to do it. And that doesn't, I would say, that doesn't mean don't write it down. If you're not going to do it, still write it down and go back to it later when you decide you're going to do it. But like, it doesn't profit you anything until you actually take action on it. And I, I love that your success, that you, you've defined your success in the duplication aspect. Have I, have I created a man who can go and create another man? Or am I just like getting people to a point where they're okay, but they're not really to the, they don't have, they don't haven't caught the crusade or the burning fire or passion to go and help another. And I think that's a huge, it's a distinction really when you're considering legacy uh, and branding specifically, you can't stop. You can't just convince one person. If you just convince one person, you're screwed because you don't have enough time in your life to be convincing one person at a time. You don't have enough time. So like if you really want to create a legacy or a movement, then you have to be able to do that when, um, that a few examples that I think of that are the, some of the best stories of like enlistment of people with sharing one idea, Martin Luther King Jr., an amazing person at enlisting. He shared one speech and that speech got broadcasted uh, to uh, the, whoever heard it initially, but I've never heard it, but that thing is still getting passed down and down and down because of the, the power of the words and what the meaning was behind it. Another one is Christ. Regardless of your your religious belief, he is one of the best marketing branding stories that you'll ever find because he got people in a three-year period of time. He was a nobody for 30 years. And in three years, uh, as the story goes, right, in three years, he had people willing to die for him. He had people willing to literally give up everything and follow him and reproduce that for at least 2,000 years now reproducing what he was trying to go after. And so like, you have to think about, okay, what, what am I doing in my life right now from a legacy standpoint, that's really causing that type of movement? How am I getting people enlisted in duplication? And I love that that's a, a key feature to whether you're successful or not. Yeah. And for the people out there that want to do something similar, I used to sell products and services that that was like what I used to do, right? You have a product and then you go out there and you try to sell it to people. And for years I did this and I was successful at it. I helped businessmen get fit. That was like the thing that I did. And I would go out there, I'd speak at events and then I would have them fill out an application and I would sell them a product or a service. What I found is that people weren't staying, right? They would get their transformation and they'd be like, thanks so much. That was amazing. Like now I'm done. I'm like, uh, what am I supposed to do? How like get you out of shape again so I can get you to hire me? Like this doesn't make any sense. And so what ended up happening is I got really bored talking about the same thing. And you may feel the same way for someone out there that's like, man, I just don't want to be stuck as the technology guy. I don't want to be stuck as the health guy. I don't want to be stuck as just the business guy or whatever industry that you're in, relationship guy. You feel like that's all you can talk about on social media to your friends. Even if you're in network marketing, you're like, I'm just like the freaking protein powder pusher, like, you know, whatever it is. And one way that I changed that is I set up this thing that back in the day, like this is what everyone's taught up to this point. If you make enough money, then you can build influence, right? Then people will follow you because now they have a reason to, and then you can make an impact. I flipped it the other way and I was like, what impact do I want to create? How can I create a mission and a vision that's bigger than a product or service? So that's number one. 
And then people, when I speak that mission, when I speak my story, when I tell other people's story about this vision, people will actually gather around it and build influence around that subject and then create products to serve it. So we have a thing called a three-dimensional business. We help our men create a mission and vision that's bigger than a product or service. For me, it's redefining what it means to be a businessman, changing the dictionary definition to the point where you cannot be called a businessman if you're not three-dimensional. Right, like that's my thing. And you heard like how I want to consult world leaders. Mm-hmm. Like at that point, you still don't know what I sell. And then what you do is you create products and services that solve the need or the problem in the world. So now I could talk about anything or sell anything that has to do with solving that problem of redefining what it means to be a businessman. And the third step is a way to give back because more blessed is the hand that gives than receives. So what we do is we partner with a nonprofit that goes and speaks to kids across America. And the reason why is because how can I solve the problem before it's a before it's a problem? Twenty five percent of U.S. homes are fatherless homes. So I'm like, cool. What if every man that invests in himself? What if it went back to helping a kid? So now the the guys know, like, yes, you can use it as a way to grow your business more, but it's also changing someone's life. So we sponsored thirty one thousand kids last year, and so three dimensional business really makes you bulletproof on the messaging standpoint, and then you can truly start with your mission and vision tell your story, bring in other people's stories like you're doing right now, and then also tell that mission and vision story so that people will gather around it and be like, yes, I'm all for that. And then when you have the group of people, you just figure out what they need, how to solve the problems in their life, and you provide the product or service, and you have a company. Yeah, that's awesome. Actually, uh, along those same lines, I actually redefined um, what smart goals mean to me (laughs) because people are – they. I think that the traditional version of a smart goal is training people to play small. It's training people to only do what they think they can achieve. It's training people to do, and, and it's all inward. Like the traditional smart goals, they're, they're all focused on only do what you can control. Only focus on what, what's in your control. And although like, I think there's a time and a place for that, I redefine them to be like, the S is sexy. The M is massive. So like, one, it has to be so alluring that people, when they hear it or see it, they want to come see it. Mount Rushmore is a perfect example. With, hey, how do we carve people's faces on the side of this mountain so people from all over the world are going to come see this, right? Is it massive enough that you can't do it by yourself? Like you have to enlist other people to actually accomplish your goal. There's no way you can do it yourself. Is it audacious enough that you're creating separation that some people are going to look at your business and say, you suck, you're rich, you're whatever, and I don't believe that you're going to do it and they're going to you're going to create a tribe. You're going to create people who love you and people who hate you. Is it remarkable? Are people going to be talking about it? Is it going to be duplicatable across the board? And then the last thing is, are you transparent with it? Are you actually sharing with the world that this is what you're going to do? Or are you just like, this is what I'm going to go do. And you share it with yourself in your bathroom. You should do that every morning, right? <laughs> to get to let it be part of you, but you've got to share it with the world. You've got to share your dreams to enlist people. People have to know what's going on. So that's I, so true, man. I, I redefined what it means. So I love this, um, this three, three dimensional business. I think a lot of people, I think a lot of people will stop. They'll, they'll get a mission statement or a vision statement and what they want. And they'll even, I think just for, I've talked to a lot of branding people, I guess. And I think they get the first two down. Okay. But the giving back is totally overlooked with most businesses. They like Tom's, I think was the first that I can really think of that really made a message from a business perspective of giving back where it's like, Hey, every time you buy a pair of shoes, we're buying a pair of shoes for somebody else. Every time this X happens, Z happens every time. And yeah, it's just like Stella, it's the, the beer company, Stella, they actually give clean water for every beer you buy, like clean water to a different country. I, I didn't know that. I don't drink beer, but I don't, I didn't know that that's, that's not, I mean, that it's that type of thing that that has to be part of your messaging and part of your branding though. And if it's not, you're missing out on a whole swath of people who in their heart, they, they see value in the first two, but they're looking for a way to give back and they're looking for a way to be charitable. And they're, you're going to appeal to a more ulterior cause with the giving back message. And that's something that I, I honestly get you to sell more too. Like, I know that when I sell a guy, I say kid, you know? So for me, it's like more forms of motivation and also that the wheel like keeps spinning, you know, you're not just helping solve one problem you're solving two problems at the same time and you're self-funding a movement of change by selling people on things that they already want right when i when i sell my guys on things 
my definition of sales is I'm giving them something. I'm getting them to do something that's in their best interest that they already want to do that they would not do without me, right? They have too many limiting beliefs in themselves. They have too many limiting beliefs about their environment. They have too many limiting beliefs about the different options out there and what's going to work for them. And so they stay in this paralysis of analysis and never get what they want. And so ultimately, if I can sell them, get them to invest in themselves, I can get them connected to something that's more valuable than their money. Right. Yeah. And and helping them, one, get connection, but two, take action on that connection. And and to like, yeah, I don't know. It is is probably connection. Just feel more connected. And that's where a lot of people, I, I work in finance and I help people, like one of the main things I deal with almost every client is helping their helping them heal their relationship with money yep. see I, I came from a very different well, i don't say very different but a, a different background than you where um same same type of arguing abusive well, I, my, my parents were abusive uh, and when i started i studied neuropsychology and found that a lot of the issues the social issues in our lives if people had confidence in their ability to, to provide for their family like if they, if they actually understood how to create value for their family, so many issues would be gone. Divorce would be almost obsolete. I mean, it's just like so many things would be gone if people understood money, but because they have a negative relationship with money, it's like their, their worst ex-girlfriend or ex-divorced person, like ex, ex-spouse, they're so, have such an unhealthy relationship with money um, due to what they've been taught that they can't even have a conversation about it. They can't even think about it. If you even attempt to bring it up, then they're like, well, what do you, they get all defensive because they're too scared to look inside and actually find out what they believe about it. And so most of what I do, yes, I, I do a lot of financial coaching, but a lot of it comes down to like, where's your mind and what's your relationship with this topic? Because there's no point in creating a financial plan or goals even until you have, you can have a healthy relationship with this topic. Do you have a book you recommend? Do I have a book? Um, I have a few books actually that I, I have. I wrote my own book called the nine pillars to build a meaningful legacy. Just cause I wanted my, my word out there, but richest man in Babylon is probably one of the best books to help people understand uh, like a relationship with money. Think and grow rich is good. Uh, Born rich by Bob Proctor, the, the audio program. I don't know if you ever listened to that one. Um, that one I found it on YouTube. That one is phenomenal at just helping people understand that they in and of themselves have value and it's not tied to a dollar. Like you as an individual have value. You're worthy of income. And there's, and I love that you brought this up earlier as well, that as long as you can add value, you can always exchange it for a dollar. I do a whole webinar on that principle of monetary value, just value exchange. People are so caught in their mind that like something costs money. It really comes down to value. When I, I did summer sales out in Philadelphia and in Utah, a gallon of milk is like two bucks. And in Philadelphia, a gallon of milk was five bucks. I did not drink milk when I was out in Philadelphia because I didn't value that, that value exchange was no longer consistent with my reality. And so often people, they get stuck in their own reality and they don't understand that it's a value exchange. And the only reason that you don't have the monetary that you want in life is because you're not willing to add enough value first. You're not willing to forgive, give first. You're not willing to do that. And so as long as you're not willing to do that, then there's no way that somebody's going to pay you more value than you're going to give them. It's just not going to happen. Why would they? Yeah, man. I think that I read Think and Grow Rich when I had only made $19,000 in a year. And I remember writing down my goal statement. I wanted to make 100K that year. And I was like, man, I was saying it every single morning. And I even made a commitment to myself that if I didn't make $285 a day, then I would have to work till 10 p.m. And it was so interesting that once you start looking for opportunity, it shows up. And I believe that people have $100,000, million dollar, billion dollar opportunities around them every day. As long as in the right, right environment, I like to look at it like Lamborghinis. Like if you live in the middle of, you know, Pittsburgh, I don't know, some random place in the middle of the U S and you're looking for a Lamborghini, you're probably not going to see one for a long time. But if you're on Rodeo drive where there's lots of them, 
you're going to see them every single street corner. And so you want to be in the place where there is opportunity. But for the most part, there's opportunities around everyone, everywhere, especially with social media. And so if you're not looking for it, if you're not aware of it, you don't even notice the cars, right? The opportunities that are going by you. And I all of a sudden started seeing all these opportunities. And I was seeing opportunities of people that needed flooring done in their house, digging holes in their backyard, selling furniture out of their front yard. There's so much free furniture on the side of the road. I would just take off the sign, take a picture of it, list it up, and sell it out of people's front yards all the time. I would take things out of trash cans. I did everything that I could because I had a goal, and I was going to do anything. I just asked for the opportunities, right? That's what it says to do. Show me the opportunities on how I'm going to make the money, and I'll take action on them when I see them. That's exactly what you say every morning. And so I said it every morning. I did exactly what it said, and I hit exactly the goal in that year. Yeah, that's awesome. I, th- I think that's the that's the key point is, um, are you willing to take the initiative to change and actually just do it, right? And I, I uh, that was another note that I made when you were telling your story is when when your friend, when you, he said, oh, I'm eating this because I want to perform better. My, my coach says to perform better. Rather than thinking, oh, that seems dumb. I like my whatever. You're like, oh, okay. <laughs> like, I'll, go, I'll go try it, you know? And you just go try it. Being willing to try things, I... Um, I've been, uh, accused sometimes of just being like way willing to spend money in places that may or may not give me a return, but it's like, I'm not going to be held back by fear of failure. Um, I'm going to just go for it. I'm going to go for whatever I need to do. And if it works great, if it doesn't work, then I'm going to move on, but I'm not going to hold myself back for any financial reasons. And for you, there's healthy food, actual fruits and vegetables. They cost more than cheap, crappy food initially, right? Initially, because you have the health problems later, but initially people think they're saving money, but rather than making that an obstacle, you said, look, I'm going to try it. Right. And you're able to lose 60 pounds. That's awesome. But so many people won't do it one because, uh, they care about what people think about them and they're scared of the naysayers. They're scared of the people who are going to try and tear them down. But then two, they just, a lot of it comes down to finances. You ask anybody why they're not doing what they love. And you touched on this as well. The person who's sitting in the office thinking, man, I wish I could go serve the, the poor in other countries. Why don't they? Well, they don't have the time. Why don't they have the time? Because they're too busy making money to survive. Yeah, it's pretty funny. Like the money thing is just the most hilarious thing to me because you either will or you won't. I think so many people blame the number one way to never have success is to blame other people for your failure. Absolutely. Blame, blame money, blame time, blame all these things. And I've been coaching men for a long time now. And we don't allow any of it in our community. It's either a yes or a no. You make a decision. People will say, man, I would love to go to your live event, but I just don't have the funds. I'm like, we just say, yeah, you do. Like, that's all we say to them. Yeah, you do have the funds. Like, you go find it or like you sell the things out of your house. Like, what, what's more valuable to you, the result that you're trying to create or the money in your pocket, the resources that you have, the friendships that you have. And when people say things like, I don't have the money to do something, Well, if you're 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years old and you don't have money to do something, then you probably should get off your ass and go invest in something to be able to make money. Like that should be your cue. Like your bank account is screaming at you saying, learn how to make money and bring more value to the marketplace. What is, how do you make more money? Money will always follow value and value is solving more or bigger problems for more amounts of people. That's Mm -hmm. like, the simplest definition I could ever think of. I, I, I even the other day, I, my friend, I, had a, I was speaking at a live event. It's called Funnel Hacking Live. They had like five thousand tickets sold, but the tickets were like a thousand bucks a piece. But they had some people that couldn't go to the event, so there was people that were like, "Hey, does anyone want to sell their ticket to me?" And then there was other people that were like, "Hey, I'm trying to sell my ticket." But these people were so lazy. No offense to them. Well, actually offense. They were so lazy that they actually wouldn't just go look for the person that wants to sell a ticket and buy it. So all I did is I went up and I didn't even put my own money into it. I would message all the people with tickets and say, hey, I'll give you 600 bucks. Hey, I'll give you 700 bucks for your ticket. And then I would go to the people that are buying and I'd say, hey man, I have a ticket for 700 bucks. Can you send me the money? And they would send me the money, I'd pay the person, I'd transfer the ticket, I made $100 off each ticket for fun. And I was speaking at the event, so this is probably not even, against, this is probably like against the rules. But I just wanted to make fun of or like press on the fact of my value had nothing to do with anything in that situation. People had value for the ticket and I was just brokering the exchange, right? I was not the valuable asset. They weren't buying my information. No matter how bad my mindset was or anything like that, that exchange would have happened anyway. So it's like you can sell things that have value already 
right? Information has a ton of value. Results are what people buy, right? My friend always says that when you sell a vacation, you don't sell the journey, you sell the vacation, the destination. People will show you on a beach with your family, everything's great, you got a coconut in your hand and you're sitting there watching the blue water. But the actual journey to go on vacation is terrible. You got to buy flights and your baby's crying and then you fly economy because you can't pay for first class and you're worried about work the whole time but they sell you this end result. They don't sell you the process. So even with investing, right? It's like people show you your compounding returns. They don't tell you about like the, actually you have to make money to invest money and like, you know, random things like that. There's, there's a journey to everything, but if you sell the journey, no one will buy. But ultimately if you get people to buy, you can give them the results that they want, which is a vacation. Right. And and a good vacation. That's awesome. So I, I'm a, conscious of, of time here with us, but I want to know when, uh, when, when are you speaking next? Where are you speaking? How can people get in touch with you or like interact with you? Join your, jo- join your crusade, join your movement. Um, yeah, so for the, for the guys out there that I actually have a free community that's called billion dollar brotherhood on Facebook. And if you just say that I sent you, they'll accept you. We have 2,500 other business owners in there that are all men it's super, it's amazing because I, I look at our community like a body, like some people are pinky, some people are feet, like whatever it is. And when we all come together, we create one large body that all has different functions, skill sets, talents, and abilities that makes us a lot more powerful. And so I actually have a book coming out called Modern Day Businessman, Success Without Sacrifice. And I'm actually launching that book in June, this next coming month, yet at our live event, which is called bdblive.com. I have a promo code that's brotherhood20 that allows me to invest in the other men out there. I'm bringing in some of the best speakers in the world that I've invested over $250,000 of my own money to be able to build relationships with and bring them in. And I'm actually giving my book away to everyone for free there along with $300 worth of physical product and a bunch of other crazy stuff. So uh, if you think that the things that I'm saying are fun and exciting, grab the book. That's awesome. But if you want the book for free and you want an immersion experience like I had that allowed me to have a not one non-profitable month since 2016 and to bring in all the trainers that I invest hundreds of thousands of dollars in, I'm going to bring them into a room to be able to teach guys just like you. So you go to bdblive.com and promo code brotherhood20. And then also obviously for free, come to the billion dollar brotherhood Facebook group. Okay. And with that, where, where and when are those dates? Ha- like where and when is it happening? Is yeah, it so it's in San Diego and the best time that you can come, which is going to be in June 14th to 16th. Okay. And yeah, San Diego is amazing at that time. Legitimately for the VIPs, like we're showing up, you'll be able to meet the nonprofit. You'll be able to hear about the 31,000 kids that we sponsored, which is phenomenal. By coming, you also get to sponsor kids as well, which is fun. Uh, again, you get $300 worth of physical product uh, from all of our sponsors and we have a custom made backpack. We go to a five star dinner the first night. I bought, I rented out the whole restaurant at the hotel for both lunches and I had them serve us outside on the rooftop. So it's going to be perfect weather connecting with other businessmen. So whether you want collaborations, you want to find clients because people need your service, or if you want to go there and actually just build friendships and get knowledge base that you can go back and have a transformation like I did that transformed my family forever. This is the event for businessmen. Okay. No, that's awesome. And on, on Facebook and Instagram, what are you on? I know you said the uh, Billion Dollar Brotherhood on Facebook. Yeah, on Instagram, Instagram uh, it's Nicholas Bailey. I would love to be able to connect. I think we're reaching like over 100,000 people a month right now on Instagram, and it's been the most fun thing ever. Okay. Yeah, so all those links, they're going to be in the show notes. Um just so that it'll be easy and quick reference. Um, even if you don't make it to the June event, just if if you happen to listen to this podcast after that, still connect and stay engaged with him because he's going to do more events and he's going to be speaking in more places. So you don't want to miss out on that. This yeah, we posted section, like 80 events, I think it is now. Th- this cool. year? No, 80 events total is what we've done. Not this oh, year. It'd be crazy. I was like, geez, that is a that's moving. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a lot. I, that, yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so this next section, this is we're, we're getting close to the end here, but I want to ask these questions. Uh, it's called Legacy on Rapid Fire. Cool. So there's five questions and they're one to one word to one sentence answers Cool. to, to keep things moving. Um, so the first one is, what do you feel is holding you back from reaching the next level in your legacy today? Myself. And what do you feel is, is the hardest thing you've ever accomplished? Getting over myself. Okay. What do you feel is your greatest success at this point in your life? Getting married to my wife. 
<laughs> Good. Uh, what do you feel is the biggest secret? If you had to deduce everything, you're on your deathbed, you can only share one secret with your, your posterity. What's the biggest secret that's contributed to your success? You can actually look at your future self and experience your future success and become the person that you're going to be in the future today that changes the world around you. Awesome. Everybody go back and re-listen to that. It's absolutely true, but it'll take you a while to like comprehend all the moving parts, I think. But it's awesome when, you, when the penny drops. Okay, and what books would you recommend to the Fuel Your Legacy audience? Obviously, your book, which say the name and title again. Yeah, Modern Day Businessman, Success Without Sacrifice. And that's specifically for the businessman. Uh, also, the Bible is amazing. Um, it's been my biggest mentor tip, that's for sure. Built my whole business off of it. And obviously, there's good books like Richest Man in Babylon, like you said, that really break things down further because a lot of times we can listen but not hear. There's like a big difference between those two things. And so sometimes you need those good mentors that can help you actually hear. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, is there anything that you wanted to share on this that you haven't got a chance to talk about or share? Today? No, man, I just uh, think that every person out there, like I said, you have a one in 400 trillion chance of being born. So the thought that you aren't actually here with an opportunity to do something really big is really, really dumb. Just flat out really dumb to think about. So if you have potential, I don't care how much you have or how little, let's go out there and figure out how can you maximize your potential here because there's been a, there was one guy that was alive that he had a huge vision for his life, never accomplished it. He only helped one person. That one person went on to helping another person that went out there and impacted millions and millions of people's lives. You never know what piece of the domino you are in in life. And forget about all the credibility. Just do your best every single day. And you never know what domino you're going to push over. Yeah, absolutely. So final question here. Um, now you're going to be dead. Okay. So we're going to pretend you're dead. And now you're, your, your great, 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 great grandchildren are sitting around the table talking about you, talking about your legacy and what you left behind, what you created. What do you want them to be saying about your legacy? Man, that's a really good question. I would hope they're not talking about me too much. I know I probably should want them to talk about me a lot. Uh, I just hope that they look at me as someone who was committed. All the things that you can control, committed, followed through, trustworthy, had integrity, and went out there and won. And those are the things that like for me, like being someone who goes out there and takes risks and does whatever he can, I'd rather watch a movie of someone who fails over and over again trying to have success and does everything it takes than someone who just had success easy or never tried. So I want to be the person that did everything he could and left nothing in the tank and lived in those boundaries of integrity, trust, commitment, and follow through. Awesome. Hey, well, thank you so much. I'm super excited for this to go live and for people to hopefully make it down to your event uh, and just experience what it would be like. I'm going to go join your community just because I, I like other businessmen. I like people who think the way I think. Um, and I've learned some things today I'm to, that I can implement. And every day, that's my goal is just to learn two or three things that I can implement the next day and become better and better and better. Um, but I super appreciate your focus on helping men. I, I think there's a major breakdown and what is possible there if we, as men, learn to take control and, and no longer give any possible excuse, just complete ownership of everything in our life and accept agency. Um, that's a big thing for me, uh, understanding that you have a choice. People don't believe they have a choice in a lot of things. And so getting them aware that they have a choice is, is crucial. And I love the way you do it. I love what you're doing. Um, and I'm excited to see and follow your business and, and be part of it. Thanks, man. Well, I appreciate it again. And for everyone listening, I appreciate it as well. Yeah. Hey, thanks a bunch. And we, we will chat with you soon um, on Fuel Your Legacy. If you want to go to uh, my YouTube or face, Facebook, um, the Legacy Mastermind uh, group, then we're going to be discussing some things there. And then we're going to be doing some book reviews. And also my website, samnickerbacher.com is available there if you want to get more in touch with some of the things we talked about today. So Thanks so much, and we'll catch you next time on Feel Your Legacy. Thanks for joining us today. If what you heard resonated with you, please like, comment, and share on social media. Tag me so I can give you a shout-out on the next episode. And thanks to all those who have left a review. It helps spread the message of what it really takes to build a legacy that lasts. Catch you next time on Feeling Your Legacy.